Yes, good morning, children. So today we have got the chapter Silk Road to be done. So this chapter Silk Road is a is a travelogue, as it's clear. It's a travelogue where the Nick, where the author Nick Middleton is describing his journey to Mount Kailash. So he actually wants to do Kora. That is, he his purpose is spiritual. Uh, his journey towards you know Mount Kailash has spiritual purpose. And uh, in this uh, special, in this very particular chapter, we see like how the author starts from Ravu and reaches Mount Kailash in the end, but how uh, he reaches there, what kind of difficulties he faced, what were his experiences or uh, what he saw, the kinds of things around those things, those places, you know, that describes in this particular Silk Route. So here in this very chapter uh, written by Nick Middleton. So he's a professor of geography at Oxford University. So keeping in mind like, like what his designation is, what, his, what he is, that makes us have a clear picture as to why he is so much interested in these kinds of intrinsic details of the journey, right? And secondly, the chapter uh, Silk Road, because it's a travelogue, so of course, we would be like uh, reading more about the kind of journey it was, the kind of uh, uh, difficulties he had to face or the kinds of people he witnessed or saw on the way. Uh, so here we would be uh, meeting a few characters. Uh, first of all, uh, we would see the inhabitant of the place, Rabu, that woman would be there. And she would be uh, gifting this Nick Middleton uh, sheepskin coat because she would know that uh, uh, like uh, Nick Middleton, the author, might need that kind of, you know, woolen cloth uh, later on in the in the later part of journey because it would become intense cold and actually Nick Middleton would rarely require it and he would also become sick uh, of that height he will also also develop pneumonia so that gift will become really handy later on so then we have uh, uh, apart from Nick Middleton and that woman the one who, whose role would be just momentary in the very beginning of the chapter then we would have Suzanne with us who is the owner of the car and uh, we would see him as a very, very expert or a skilled driver, the one who would know as to what kind of uh, journey it would be, the kind of you know driving skills which would be required that Suzanne would have. Then we have Daniel. So Daniel is also a very, very important part, uh, important character in the story. So he would be the he would be like interpreted from uh, Lhasa. Then finally we would meet Norbu in the end of the last part of this this you know. Uh, travelogue that Norbu is actually a Tibetan who is working in Beijing in China. So we he also had come to this uh, Mount Kailash to do Kora, right? So Nick Middleton would find Norbu, uh, he would find in him a perfect companion to go for Kora around the Mount Kailash, right? So first let us see like, uh, let's start a uh, like travelogue. It's a very interesting uh, travelogue. You would all love to see this, read it. So here it is, Silk Road by Nick Middleton. A flawless half moon floated in a perfect blue sky on the morning. We said our goodbyes. So the day the narrator, the author says like they, uh, they started off for journey towards Mount Kailash from Rahu. At the time, half moon was floating in the perfect blue sky. It means it was a clear sky. It was clear, no, the like weather was very clear and moreover, it was still not dawn, okay? Extended banks of the cloud, like long French loaves, glowed pink as the sun emerged to splash the distant mountain tops with a rose tinted blush. So the sun was just rising and uh, the sky glowing pink, you know, that, uh, that is how the author is describing the morning beauty as. Now that we were leaving Rabu, Lamo said she wanted to give me a farewell present. So when, uh, so it was which place? Which place is it? It is Rabu. So it is Rabu where, which the place they were leaving for the further journey. So there was one woman at whose house uh, the narrator Nick Middleton had been staying in. So Lamo wanted to give Nick Middleton a gift, farewell present. So what it was? One evening, I had told her to Daniel that I was heading towards Mount Kailash to complete the Kora. 
So Daniel is an interpreter. Okay, interpreter means the one who um, you must understand, like the one who translates a language for both of the parties. So one evening, the uh, the Nick Middleton told that lady uh, Lamo that he was going to do Kora uh, around the uh, to Mount Kailash. That he was going to Mount Kailash to do the Kora. And uh, she said, and she had said that I ought to get some warmer clothes. After ducking back into her tent, she emerged carrying one of the long sleeve sheepskin coats. She emerged carrying one of the long sleeve sheepskin coats that all the men wore. So, because she got to know that Nick Middleton was going into uh, going to Mount Kailash, and uh, she knew that that uh, while going to that place, maybe on the way also. It would be very cold, and he might need some uh, good woolens. Uh, and so she went inside her tent and brought a sheepskin coat. Right? It was a long sleeve sheep sheepskin coat, which which the people of that area usually wear. Cezanne seized me up as we clambered into his car. So Cezanne seized me up as we clambered into his car. Ah, yes, he declared, Drogba sir. So Cezanne, you know, when they went into the car, then this man, you know, Cezanne, the one who was the driver of the car, the one who owned the car, okay, the one in whose car the narrator was going to Mount Kailash. So that person showed him the Drogbas, that is, Drogbas are the shepherds, the nomadic shepherds, okay. We took a shortcut to get off the Chang Town. So they took a shortcut. So Cezanne was a uh, one who was actually taking narrator or the author to his destination. And he was a very skilled driver and he knew all the routes. So he took a shortcut. Cezanne knew a route that would take us southwest, almost directly towards Mount Kailash. It involved crossing several fairly high mountain passes. So through that shortcut, they would be able to cross many high mountain passes, he said. But no problem, sir. He assured us, if there is no snow. What was the likelihood of that, I asked? Not knowing, sir, until we get there. So these people, those who live in hilly areas, you know, they happen to be very adventurous. Uh, they don't really mind the, the challenges. They don't really mind uh, problems because they know, because they have to, they live um, uh, amidst problems or challenges in these kinds of areas. So this man, you know, he knew a shortcut and which would go through many mountain passes. And he told the uh, author, like, so far it doesn't snow, everything would be fine. Then author asked, like, how can you be sure that uh, there won't be any snowfall or if the things would be all right? Then his answer was very, you know, uh, cool. He said, never mind, we'll see, like, when we would reach there, only when that only then we would come to know actually like how or what kind of situation is there. So see his answer. So when author asked what was the likelihood of that means uh, how can you be sure that the things would remain fine? Then his answer is not knowing sir until we get there. Means until we reach there we can't say. So when we don't know, if we don't know right now like what would happen next, why to be tensed? From the gently rolling hills of the Ravu. So from the gently rolling hills of Ravu, the shortcut took us across vast open plains with nothing in them except a few gazelles. So then they started from Ravu. And uh, the shortcut, uh, the shortcut which he had taken, uh, they reached the plains where there was nothing, only the gazelles. These are the animals that would look up from nibbling the arid pastures and frown before bounding away into the void. So there were only gazelles and the gazelles would, they, they were seen, you know, eating the arid pasture, uh, pastures, grasslands, and uh, before they would see anyone coming towards them, they would run away towards the void, empty areas. So when they started moving towards uh, the plains, they saw only gazelles and the gazelles, uh, the moment they saw these strangers or coming in car, they just ran towards the empty uh, area. Further on where the plains became more stony than grassy. So the plains became more stony than grassy, a great herd of wild ass 
came into view. So after the ghazals, where uh, because the geographically also the uh, the place was changing. So after when they found the place becoming more stony, then they started finding they started locating the uh, wild asses who were like uh, visible now. Earlier gazelles were there, now asses are there. Cezanne told us we were approaching them long before they appeared. Kayang, he said, pointing towards a far off ball of dust. So then uh, he pointed out towards the, uh, you can say, uh, smog. Uh, he said, pointing towards a far off ball of dust when we drew near. I could see the herd galloping in mass, wheeling and turning in tight formation as if they were practicing maneuvers on some predetermined course. Plumes of dust billowed into the crisp, clean air. So the, this place, you know, where there was, you know, where there were, uh, where there were dusty clouds, you can say, because of the whole, you know. So then the, uh, they saw the plumes of dust billowed into the crisp, clean air. So the place was all dusty. As hills started to push up once more from the rocky wilderness, we passed solitary drop bus, tending their blocks. So as they started, uh, as the hills started to push up once more from the rocky wilderness, they again came across the uh, shepherds, the lonely shepherds who were tending their flocks. So once again, they found the shepherds who were taking or uh, who were making their uh, flocks of animals graze over them. Sometimes men, sometimes women, these well-wrapped figures would pause and stare at our car. So for those drogbas, uh, the travelers uh, were no, no doubt uh, a frequent sight. And whenever they would see these people, whenever they would come across some drogba or the shepherd, those people would stare at them out, out of anxiety or all. So occasionally waving as we passed. So these people happen to be very friendly. Okay, hilly people, you know, they happen to be very friendly. And whenever they would come across some drogba, the drogbas would stare at them and even would wave at them. When the track took us close to their animals, the sheep would take evasive action, veering away from the speeding vehicle. So of course, when the vehicle, when their car would be nearing some uh, uh, sheep, the sheep would just run away. We passed nomads' dark tents, pitched in splendid isolation. So we passed nomads' dark tents, pitched in splendid isolation. Uh, so then they came across the dark tents, uh, which were of the nomads. They were in stark isolation, usually with a huge black dog, a Tibetan mastiff. So they came across the places which were like quite isolated ones, and there were the uh, tents of these nomadic people and th in those tents they also had the Tibetan mastiffs, the dogs. Uh, so the black dog, a Tibetan mastiff, standing guard. These beasts would cock their great big heads when they became aware of our approach and fix us in their sights. So as is, it is customary for all dogs, but for these especially, you know, Tibetan mastiffs, because they were very ferocious, they are known for their being ferocious. So the moment they would hear uh, the approaching of our car, they would, you know, uh, they would come and, uh, you know, fix us in their sights and they would look at us. As we continued to draw closer, they would explode into action. So first they would keep on looking at us and the moment uh, the author, the party in car would approach them near, they would just, uh, uh, you know, explode into action and speeding directly towards us, then they would attack them, attack the car in a way, uh, like a bullet from a gun and nearly as fast. So these mastiffs who are known for ferocity or for their speed, for their uh, aggressiveness, so th this was quite visible now. These shaggy mo monsters, blacker than the darkest, darkest night, usually wore bright red collars and barked furiously with massive jaws. So the description is also there. They had massive jaws. Uh, they were no. Uh, they were called as shaggy monsters, and uh, because of their skin, they were they were known to be like blacker than the darkest nights. They were completely fearless of our vehicle. Usually, the animals are afraid of the animal, uh, vehicles, like cars and all. But here, these animals were not at all afraid of the cars. Also, 
shooting straight into her path, causing Suzanne to break and swerve. So once even Suzanne had to apply sudden brakes, and he, his car also scudded. Uh, the point is that he didn't want to uh, he didn't want to hit the dogs because the dogs were fearless. They just came on the way, and they might have uh, met with an accident if Suzanne had not been careful. The dog would make chase for a hundred meters or so before easing off. So before he would stop, he would chase the car for about hundred meters, having seen us off the off the property. So the dog would actually see off these people. Uh, he would make them run off. He would make the car go off site. Only then it would come back. It wasn't difficult to understand why ferocious Tibetan mastiffs became popular in China's imperial courts as hunting dogs brought along the Silk Road in ancient times as tribute from Tibet. So uh, you can't make out like how come those Tibetan mastiffs, like such ferocious dogs, the ones who used to be the uh, you know hunting dogs of the imperial courts of China, how come they happen to reach here on the Silk Road? Actually, they were uh, a gift of uh, Tibet. They were given as a tax, as tax from Tibet to use these roads. Got it? Otherwise, uh, these the Tibetan mastiffs, you know, the, who were so ferocious, they were used as the as the hunting dogs for the imperial courts of China. If they were uh, such royal dogs, if they were so important from their uh, uh, because of the qualities they had, then how come they happened to be there in the in the nomadic tents? The reason is that they were gifted by Tibet as texts. Got it. So by now we could see snow-capped mountains gathering on the horizon. So by this time the snow-capped mountains were visible. We entered a valley where the river was wide and most, mostly clogged with ice. Brilliant white and glinting in the sunshine. So by this time when they reached the place where the snow-capped mountains had started appearing, so it, we entered a valley where the river was wide and mostly clogged with ice. Brilliant white and glinting in the sunshine. So, uh, children, if we uh, happen to, uh, the words are such that we can have a clear vision of like that scene in front of us. So, can we imagine a river which is fully iced, okay, totally frozen, not just frozen, like you're totally clogged with ice, which is looking brilliantly white and shining in sunshine. So, right, the river which is like where water is not there, but only ice, the icy sheet, which is glowing. The, uh, the trail hugged its bank, twisting with the meanders as we gradually gained height and the valley sides closed in. So the trail hugged its bank. So the trail, the way, you know, it hugs its uh, banks and uh, what happened? Twisting with the meanders, meanders are the turns, sharp bends. So now there were sharp bends on the road and uh, slowly and gradually as they were uh, going up, the valley sides started closing in. The valley got disappeared and they started and their car was swerving or moving upon the bends, bendy roads. The turns became sharper and the ride bumpier. Cezanne now in third gear as we continued to climb. So now the track had become quite difficult because now they were uh, going quite up on the hilly areas. Now the turns had become even more sharper and the ride had become bumpier. And now Suzanne was driving in the third gear because now it was, uh, because they were climbing. The track moved away from the icy river, laboring through steeper slopes that supported big rocks daubed with patches of the bright orange light gun. Beneath the rocks, hunks of snow clung on in the near permanent shade. I felt the pressure building up in my ears, held my nose, snorted and cleared them. We struggled around another tight bend and Suzanne stopped. He had opened his door and jumped out of his seat before I realized what was going on. Snow, said Daniel, as he too exited the vehicle, letting in a breath of cold air as he did so. So now when they were moving up, when they were going up the hills, because the height, were, uh, the height was gaining. And so, uh, so at one point of time, the author also felt uh, the pressure being built up in his ears and also he had to clear himself. And then afterwards, Suzanne stopped the car because 
uh, now in front of the car there was an obstacle like ice snow was there so both daniel and uh, suzan they left the car uh, i guess to clear up the debris or you to clear up the snow which might have stopped their vehicle which might have come on their way so a swath of the white stuff lay across the track in front of us stretching uh, stretching for maybe 15 meters before it petered out and the dirt trail reappeared the snow continued on either side of us something uh, sorry smoothing the abrupt bank on the upslope side the bank was too steep for our vehicle to scale so there was no way around the snow patch i joined daniel as suzan stepped on to the encrusted snow and began to slither and slide forward stamping his foot from time to time to ascertain how sturdy it was i looked at my wrist watch we were at 5 to 10 meters above sea level so the place where they were all obstructed because of the snow in front of their car so they these people even the author got down the car and he also had to help them out so at this time you know they were about 5 to 10 meters above the sea level this is what he could see from his altimeter from the watch which he had okay the snow didn't look too deep to me but the danger wasn't its depth daniel said the snow didn't look, took uh, uh, the snow was not very deep it was, it doesn't matter how deep the snow is but uh, the danger wasn't the danger wasn't its depth daniel said so much as its icy top layer so the depth of the snow was not that that uh, you know uh, uh, that matter of concern as much was the concern like its icy top layer was more you know uh, was more dangerous for them because that could make their car slip or slip if we slip off the car could turn over he suggested as we saw sizan grab handfuls of dirt and fling them across a frozen surface so in order to avoid the car being slipped from that uh, icy top layer sizan picked up some dirt and all and and threw it on the road okay the purpose you might have been able to make out like the purpose was to make the road a, become a little uh, rough sizan grabbed handfuls of dirt and fling them across the frozen surface we both pitched in and when the snow was spread with soil daniel and i stayed out of the vehicle to lighten sizan's load so now they these people you know they put some soil on the road that is on the uh, on the icy sheet so that the road would become a little rough and uh, the both uh, daniel as well as uh, the narrator nick middleton they didn't get into the car because they didn't want to make the load they didn't want to put put much load on the car daniel and i stayed out of the vehicle to lighten sizan's load he backed up and drove towards the dirty snow so he backed up and drove towards the dirty snow eased the car onto its icy surface and slowly drove its length without apparent difficulty 10 minutes later we stopped at another blockage not good sir sizan announced as he jumped out again to survey the scene so now this time sizan also announced that it was really a bit difficult okay after 10 minutes of the drive from that place where they had cleared the where they had to where they had to make the road become a bit rough thereby flinging some soil onto it after that after 10 minutes again the there was a blockage now and uh, this time he decided to try and drive round the snow this time he decided to try and drive round the snow the slope was steep and studded with major rocks now what kind of uh, what kind of way was it it was a steep steep road studded with major rocks but somehow sizan negotiated them so sizan was able to manage that kind of road so we can make out like how good the driver he was his four wheel drive vehicle lurching from one obstacle to next in so doing he cut off one of the hairpin bends regaining the trail further up where the snow had not drifted so while uh, negotiating these kinds of you know difficult paths like steep paths 
which was all covered with with the major rocks so he even crossed he even you know went through a hairpin bend so hairpin bend is a very 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 sharp bend you might might be going it so this way you know he was able to trail further and further okay children up till here is enough tomorrow we'll continue from page number 77 and uh, meanwhile 